Hello out there to all of my Facebook friends, my Google friends, my YouTube viewers, you know, basically my audience. I'm here, Jonathan Bangle, the host of Naked Tax Talk, where we bear down to the naked truth about our personal selves, our business lives, and of course, our monetary lives. And why do we focus on those three parts? Well, because what I know to be true is that when we improve the self, the business also gets better. The business, which happens to be a reflection of who we are. And then, of course, if we improve ourselves, the money also gets better, which is a reflection of our business and a reflection of who we are. You know, I'm often asked all the time, Jonathan, why do you have to always show up naked on your show? Well, babies, the reason why is because nakedness symbolizes courage. It's the same sensation that when you get a surprise IRS bill in the mail and you're freaking out and they want to talk to you. It's that same idea that I'm going to get naked in front of somebody I don't even know. It's that same fear, intimidation, and everything else that comes along with it. But if we can step into the nakedness of who we are, there are no power, there's no words, there's no words, and there's no actions that can strip us of the power of who we are. And at the end of the day, it's like RuPaul says, baby, we're all born naked. And at the end of the day, the rest is just drag. So speaking of drags, I want to let you guys know that I've got an awesome guy that we've talked to several times by ourselves. His name is Craig Darling. He is like an advertising Google guru. And I'm going to pick his brain today about marketing and everything else. And then I promise if you stay a little bit towards that end of the call today or the show today, we're going to talk about trust and how they impact our taxes and of course, we're going to answer questions like, can we actually have our children somehow integrated into our businesses so we can send them to college tax-free? So with that, without much further ado, I'm going to bring on my guest. Oh, I forgot to let you guys all know, but don't forget that this is an interactive show live right now. If you're with it watching live, let us know that you're here. Go ahead and say hello, introduce yourselves, comment as we go along, and the both of us will respond to you accordingly. So, Craig, come on to Naked Tax Talk Raw. Thank you so much for being here tonight with me live on my show. Would you go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody out there? Ah, well, yes. Take shirt off first, but uh, okay. Yes, baby. Yes. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. This is this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, my name is Craig <laughs> Darling, as you've said so eloquently, and uh, my company is called. Darling Companies or Darling Digital depends on what aspect I'm looking at. But uh, I live in Chandler, Arizona. I've been married for 30 some years. I have uh, three dogs and three cats. That pretty much sums up my life. <laughs> uh, you got more fur babies than I do. I just got three. And no, they're not deductible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, Craig, so tell us a little bit about, you know, your background. Like, how did you find yourself surfing as you put on the intro of the intake form? How did you find yourself surfing on the Internet for other people? Well, you, you know, uh, I started back in 19, and this is going to go back, and I, I promise I won't start with the year I was born. Okay? <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> in, in, 19, in 1977, I started selling automobiles. And that's, that's really uh, not a big deal, but I was going to school to become a music education teacher. Oh. And uh, I discovered automobile sales, and guess what? I really, really liked it. So uh, I started working in the industry, and that was about the time the industry started to change for the better, I might add. Uh -huh. uh, things like customer satisfaction came into play, et cetera. So, so uh, I, I moved with it, and I, and I tried to shape it, uh, and, and make it better. And then the internet happened. And uh, so I had practiced a little bit of writing uh, some code, uh, the old fashioned code, uh, Linux, et cetera, when I was a kid. And uh, my dealer walked into my office and said, hey, uh, you know how to write code? And I go, yeah. He goes, you're the internet manager. Wow. Okay. And all of a sudden they brought all of these pieces of equipment into my cubicle that that really I had no room to write anything anymore. <laughs> you remember how big they were, right? It's That's like, true. I had I, I, I could have all the screens like I have in front of me right now, right? Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, 
uh, from there, I, I just started developing things like uh, we didn't have email marketing then, right? Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, CRMs, customer retention management system. So I had to develop and generate all of this as well as putting ads online and, and, and trying to uh, create all of this. It was back, it was the wild, wild west back then. But anyway, <laughs> two years after we started, uh, General Motors uh, inducted me into the Automotive Hall of Fame. And uh, from there, uh, the world just took off for us. I started uh, uh, speaking uh, around the country. Uh, life was good. And then 2008 hit. I don't know wow. if you were around in 2008, but it, I it certainly was, it was good for a guy that thought he was a rich guy because I lost everything, right? Wow. So I had to start all over. And one of the things that I did with starting all over was I started doing uh, social media. I started doing... Uh, digital advertising for people. And then one day, accidentally, I discovered how to make content that I was creating indexed to Google in seconds. Wow. And as soon as I discovered that, a new company was born. And today we have clients literally all over the world. We have 170 clients in four countries and 27 states. Wow. The internet really gives us the opportunity to strip away the traditional borders of what we do. It's funny because, you know, as an IRS enrolled agent, I technically have no borders either. So just like what you said, I've got clients as well in other countries that we work with here in the United States. So that's kind of cool. So I got to ask you something. So uh, I want to go back to, you said music education. So I want to know what is the instrument that you play or that you, you, you want to teach? Uh, well, I am uh, uh, certified to teach the piano, the baritone, oh. the clarinet, the trumpet, the trombone, the bassoon, the saxophone, the drums, the harp, the harpsichord. And uh, that's about it. My, my husband is my husband's that as a musician that way as well all the same the same instruments you listed same thing unfortunately for me my rhythm was murdered when i was in sixth grade um i was at that time i my mom had uh managed to scramble enough money to pay for a violin which was unheard of i mean we're, we're living on 500 dollars a month right. as a kid and so my mom saved up for who knows how long and one day there's this instrument and uh, we just temporarily, I had went to a school that had an orchestra for a, maybe it was a month or two. And uh, I was playing. And as I was playing, I was tapping my feet, you know, dunk, 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 right? And the, the instructor, the teacher says to me, you don't tap your feet when you play. It's distracting. Yeah. And after that, rhythm kind of went away. It never came back. It's been very difficult for me. And yet I formed my own nonprofit called the Phoenix Renaissance Orchestra here in Phoenix for uh, 30 plus year olds to play their instruments, their string instruments, go figure. So right. you, so you're, so you were going to teach music. La, 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 well, la. It's even, it's even further than that. So I joined a band, a band out in California called Snowblind. And uh, we traveled all over and we cut a couple albums and we tried to make it big. And then one day I decided, you know what? I'm really tired of living in the back of my car. <laughs> And uh, uh, so I, I got uh, got out of the music industry. Yeah, together. like what you said, you started going into coding. So I have a question for you. Okay, help us understand as entrepreneurs out there, um, what is the difference between social media advertising versus like digital advertising? Is there really a difference? Yeah, there is. There is quite a bit of difference. So I can only explain it this way. So years ago, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, civic organizations I was a member of was a Corvette club. Uh, we raised money and uh, we helped out our, our sponsor. We sponsored the Spina Bifida Association of Arizona. And uh, one of the things that we did one weekend, we were down doing a, uh, uh, in Tucson, painting their building and putting new linoleum in that sort of thing. And I'm standing at the wall painting, you know, running up and down with the roller. And the guy standing next to me is uh running up and down with his roller too. And he, he says, well, what do you do? I told him, he was a lawyer. I told him what I did. Next thing you know, we were doing business together. So, so that's social marketing, right? Well, that was real one-on-one, -on -one, real life. But social media marketing is very much the same. Uh, you put your presence out there on social media, be real, be authentic. 
uh, and then discover through acquaintances and through interaction or engagement what each other does. And if you can do business together, there's a strong possibility you will. Whereas digital marketing or, or digital advertising is actually putting the same ads that you and I are familiar with, whether it's the television or the newspaper or the classified, uh, uh, putting a digital aspect of that uh, out there. That's digital marketing. So social media marketing is uh, it's a little more personal and uh, it's certainly more effective. So, um, and that's funny because I was going to ask you about the benefits of those, but I want to come back to when you said it's the real and authentic. So what, so a dude like me who has a, his own radio show, his own YouTube show and enjoys being on stages and talking and stuff like that. Would you say that's probably more geared towards the social media advertising, so to speak, versus digital? And would you say digital is more for the the person that's like an introvert that's like, get I don't want the camera on me. That's my husband. He doesn't want he doesn't want to be seen. Right, so right. would you say that's kind of a difference for personality types? Well, well it is. And uh, now the, the aspect of making this video, for example, that's social media. Right? Okay. The aspect of of marketing it and making. Uh, you know, digital ads where people can click and start watching, that's digital marketing. Oh. If you're not doing anything with it, it's called organic marketing. I see. Uh, so because of the way that you have this podcast set up, uh, you're, you're going to be found on various platforms uh, and you're being optimized by a company called Livestream. So yes. that's definitely a social media uh, aspect. I'm sorry. I'm looking at you and not at the camera. So I'm sorry. No, listen, it's okay. You know what? I have to, I'll be, first of all, so Sally Valencia is telling us great way to identify the difference. I'm all about that. And she's saying in advertising. So that's awesome. So yes, Sally. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Leticia, my hair. She's my stylist, which I need to go in, Letty. I'm going to come in and once it calms down a little bit, we'll get the hair done. But so, um, okay. So Did she help like me? Yeah, she could actually possibly, you know what I mean? She's pretty fantastic. Um, you know, it's interesting. Let's talk about that real fast. Let's switch gears. Hold, hold on. Because real and authentic. Real and authentic means, right, showing up in who we are and in a way not being afraid. And she, By the way, she just responded back anytime. Uh, and it's about showing up. It's about showing up unafraid of essentially what the consequences could be by showing up. For example, like the show Naked Tax Talk, right? And I had somebody say to me, Jonathan, you're always talking about sex all the time. Well, ironically enough, for me, it's like, that's who I am. If you don't like talking about sex and business, then maybe we're not a good fit. And it's about being real and authentic. Like I'm not gonna go and put on a dry suit and try to be all uptight, oopity oopity, and be presented one way only for you to run into me at the mall or the store and be like, oh, I thought you were all uptight, but here you are showing up with no shirt. Right. You agree? Yep, I do agree. And I, and I have to tell you that I have this really, really beautiful embroidered shirt, right? And I was going to wear it, but I thought, no, that might be just too flamboyant for Jonathan. Ah, oh, I would have loved it. Oh my God, I would have loved it. Hello. I was like, I'm known for my flashy jackets. I'm <laughs> known for my flashy. Oh, my beard. I'm growing it out a little bit, the stubs. Okay, so so let me ask. Okay, so social media is about what we're doing right now. It's online. We're interacting. We're messaging. We're talking. Um, all that other fun stuff. And then you've got the digital advertising, which I guess I did a little bit of that when I sent out the blast email to everybody and said, hey, come join me and Craig today because we're going to talk about these important topics. That's well, kind of more like the digital ad. Marketing, yes. Perfect. So let me ask you something. For us out there as entrepreneurs, do you have a tip that you're willing, and just a tip, don't go any further than that. Would you be willing to share with us some best practices that we can use to take us maybe to the next level? Uh, Yes and no, but it's, uh, we don't have enough time for me to get into that that subject. That's so, why I said just the tip. <laughs> so let me just let me just share with you uh, this: the most impressive thing that anyone can do that is an entrepreneur is to create a Google profile after their name. Period. Ah. That is the strongest thing you can do. Uh, there's lots of Google tools that are free 
And the first, the start to start out is to get a Gmail account. That's that's the basic gist of it. Get a Gmail account. All right, and may, and then create a profile. You said that's correct. Okay. You create a Google Business profile. They're free uh, okay. with a Gmail account. Ah, see, this is good. Okay. And then, and then here's this is another tip for us entrepreneurs that are trying to uh, uh, save our funds a little bit. When you have a Gmail account, you also get access, free access to Google Drive. And Google Drive is like Word on steroids. And it's Agreed. Free, right? Agreed. And, uh, any document that you create in Google Drive can be published immediately to the web or it can be private. It's your call. I love it. I love it. So, Craig, um, so what, is there a particular type of business that you really enjoy working with? And uh, you would say, hey, I like working with this type. And why? Uh, well, you know, I, I have my roots in the car business, so I really like working with, with car dealers. Uh, however, um, if you were to look at the... Uh, uh, the number of clients that I have, and there must be something to do with that. Uh, but most of my clients are online only uh, entities, uh, okay. like uh, Jonathan Bengal's Naked Tax Talk, for example. Uh, yeah, I have a, a lot of Amazon stores uh, that I represent, uh, which is new. I'm the only person in the country that's that's managing Amazon stores on Google. Oh, it's really, it's really rocking. We have Spotify stores. Uh, we have lawyers. It really, I don't know that there's anyone that's a particular favorite outside of the car business because I just love looking at cars. <laughs> I've the car now. Would you like to hear about my first and only car accident I've ever I've been, been in? <laughs> All right. Imagine, picture Were it. You dressed? I was. Okay. Imagine it. Imagine it. It's an old, old car built in 1916, and it's a Model T Ford. Oh, nice. So my then at the time, my boyfriend and I, uh, shout out to you, Ryan. Uh, we're still best friends even to this day. We were together for a few years, like seven, eight years. The point is, is uh, his hobby was to restore cars. And in fact, uh, this 1916 Model T was one of those cars. And thanks to him, I actually restored my own 1965 split window VW bus. So I did do that. Um, but needless to say, so we had a 1916 Model that's T. Right. You still have that bus? I sold it to buy a house in Bisbee, Arizona. Oh, well, yeah, that's about the same amount of money. House, <laughs> house bus, yeah. I helped, together, and I purchased this property. Hey, we unofficially created a partnership to purchase property because we weren't married. Just saying, tax, loophole, right. tax situation there, babies. That so is. needless to say... Um, what happened is we're driving along and 19, the 1916 Model T's for you guys out there, uh, they don't have brakes. Brakes are not a thing. And in fact, they use a cloth band that wraps around the transmission and that's what slows the vehicle down. So we're driving along and uh, chugging and ironically enough, the car's name was Chug. So we were chugging along and about 25 miles an hour, maximum speed, full throttle, right? Like we're cruising, man. We're going down, like we're going down the Autobahn and, um, this car decides that we're too damn slow. Well, no shit, Sherlock. It's a 1916 Model T. And so he decides to go to the right lane and gets in front of us and slams on his brakes. Well, as I said earlier, this thing does not have brakes. It has a band. And so Ryan went to slam the brakes. And when he did, he tried to avoid hitting the car, right? Because it's going to he's going to collide. And it just so happened that the tiny little wheels, they're about yay thick, right? catches the edge of the railroad track. This is in Tucson. It catches the edge of a railroad track. And if you've ever ridden a bike and you've ever caught your bike in like one of those grooves, forget it. You're done, right? right? And that's exactly what happened. So the tire hits this edge and the car, we're going like this, the car catches and it flips up like this and over. So Ryan luckily throws himself out of the car and I'm still stuck in it. And as it, by the way, no seatbelts. This isn't a thing in 1916. Right. And so as it comes crashing down, the entire weight of the car lands on the side of my hips and pins me down onto the ground. 
Ryan got thrown all the way out into the sidewalk, glass everywhere. You know, it's crazy. Fuel's pouring all over me because, again, on the 1916 Model T, you, you're sitting on the fuel tank like you're legit sitting on it. That's your seat, really. I mean, it's just like a little bench. So anyway, so fuel's feeling everywhere where everything's crazy. And, of course, people are, like, stopping and trying to lift the car up so I can get out and whatever. Anyways, um, luckily that guy was followed by another bypasser and they managed to get his where he lived and everything. He ended up getting charged uh, with battery for the vehicle, right? Because he caused this accident. But honestly, that was the only time I've ever been, knock on wood, in a car accident, a 1916 Model T Ford. That is craziness right there. <laughs> but certainly the cars are not... Anywhere near as safe as they are today. Right? You, it, you're, you're, you know, you're doing all you're doing a holy Jesus, you know, prayer before you get in one. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I can't believe I grew up with my parent. My dad had a pickup truck and, and we leaned literally the seat back was against the fuel tank. Wow. Yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> the, right, the, the filler knob was right by the door, you know. <laughs> and we all managed to survive. So, um, so, so yours is about cars and whatnot. So let me ask you something. Um, I want to come work with you, hypothetically. And um, what what should what should we be prepared for to have the most maximum value when we come talk to you? Uh, you know, that's, that's a really great question. And, and one of the things that we look for first and foremost is people that can read and write and spell. And that is not a uh, readily available quality in people, which blows my mind. All right. So, okay. When I would read, we want to write and spell and spell uh, grammarly.com people just saying. Right. Right. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm well versed in reading and writing. My English skills are, are among the best, but uh, I still use Grammarly. Yes, me too. Yeah, me too. I actually bought the pro edition right. and, uh, and it's connected to the Gmail and everything else. And then you see your, your mistakes and then it tells you what audience you're speaking to, the tonality, uh, yeah. all of that greatness. Right. Yeah, it's fantastic. Right. It's, really, it's really a cheater's tool. I like it. It's great. So let me ask you something. What would be a myth that you hear all the time from people who come and pick your brain? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, um, that that does happen. And, uh, you know, general, generally speaking, they, they, they tell me that the, uh, they just need they just need a piece of advice or they need uh, uh, just a little bit of help. And. Uh, Generally speaking, if they don't want to be uh, honest and, uh, and forthcoming about it, uh, they really have no idea what they're doing. They're pretending like they're entrepreneurs. Mm. So sense? let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. That's actually that's a personal and a business improvement area, right? right. So so they 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 pretend to be an entrepreneur they believe that it is right because this is something you and i both face uh i'm personally a tax advisor um and i see this a lot and i of course go like that's great let's get you so that you can be that business that powerful ceo that you were born to be shameless plug check it out rapid tax savings formula we actually talk about that um but uh so but because it's true right we 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 start business we wake up and we go, I'm going to just do something. But we don't realize all of these different things that we have to do in our business. And I'll share with the world right now with you being naked. And that is, is that 2021 for me is about learning how to manage all of the people I hire to fulfill my dreams for my business. That's the step. That's the next stage I'm at in my, in my business. And so before it was kind of like I'm dabbing along and thing, figuring things out and, you know, does it go here? Does it go there? So, Craig, at what point do we come to you and say, Craig, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I, I, I'm not doing a good job at the advertising and things like that. What point do we come into your world? Uh, as soon as uh, you realize that you need uh, uh, a serious return on your investment, uh, the products that uh, that I offer with Google 
uh, offered the best return on investment that there is. There's no doubt. Uh, one of my clients last month got 4.9 million clicks. Dang. In one month. And by the way, that's a little furniture company on Warner Road in Chandler. Okay. They're not wow. a giant chain. Uh, you know, uh, some of my clients get 300,000 clicks a month. That's the average of my three year clients. Uh, but uh, when somebody comes, I, I'll give you an example of that particular client that I was just referenced. Uh, they were spending $50,000 a month on, on marketing and they were just stubbing their toes. Uh, they spend a thousand dollars on Facebook and get nothing. They spent, you know, $10,000 on Google and get nothing. Uh, but we turned it around. We, we showed them how to utilize their Google business profile. And now that is the only thing that they are doing as far as online marketing. Google is so powerful. Google has created all these tools. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caption that for you. Okay. Google has an interest in customer satisfaction. The customer satisfaction would be how happy you and I are with Google when we use search. Mm. And like Facebook and Instagram, Google needs to keep people on its platform in order to make a living, right? Yep. So Google has designed all of these tools that small businesses simply need to fill out. And Google will serve them up to people they think are most likely to do business with them. In other words, they're trying to give their clients, which are people using search, the best possible results. So they'll stay on the Google platform. And that's what I exploit is Google's mm. tools. And I love that. Can exploit them. You don't have to be special. I love that. The French say profiter, which is to take advantage of or to exploit. Uh, so I actually love it. I remember I was in France. Uh, must have been when I was about maybe I was 30 or 33. I go back about every couple of years. And, um, and I had learned a new phrase. Profiter was this word. I saw it all over the place. Profiter, profiter. And I was like, what the hell does that word mean? So I used my contextual clues and figured out that it meant to take advantage of something. And, and I realized that each time they were using it, it was never meant in a, in a negative term. It was never meant to take advantage of like we use here, right? Um, right. It just means to like truly profit from it, to truly enjoy it. And that's what business is all about. It's about profiting so that we can enjoy our time, right? And we're letting the Google of the world help to generate that revenue so that we can get back our time, get back our money, get back our freedom to go do what we love to do. Am I right? You heard, you said it perfectly. That's Even it. If I was naked, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> it's because it's because I'm liberated and free. Um, <laughs> so um, so let's see here. So we've got about thirty ish minutes left, maybe a little bit less than that. So let's jump and change topics and talk about taxes and how it relates to advertising first and then we're going to dive in to the two things that you kind of asked me about off before you came on and we'll address some of those um so let's talk about that out there so right now you guys just saw craig and he's telling us look we can market we got to market in fact in my book shameless plug abcs of deductions and entrepreneur's guide to write-offs i actually write about a for advertising it's the number one human principle that irs understands which is that in order for our companies to be successful, we need to be seen. We need to be heard. And just like our own personal existence, if we are not seen and we are not heard, then we shall just simply fade away to the background. And that's exactly what happens in your business. Listen, if you're an entrepreneur, you must always be your real and authentic self showing up without shame and without judgment to be the badass person that you are to bring forth happiness to the world. And you do that through utilizing someone like Craig who can help to set up those systems so that you can have 4.3 or 4.9 million clicks like he just mentioned. Because the truth is, it's like walking into a bar and you're kind of going, I'm single and I wanna mingle. And so if you walk in and you're dressed like everybody else or you're full in a blue and you're just dressed ordinarily dressed 
and you're not actively out there trying to socialize, good luck trying to get a good hookup. But if you walk in there with the tight skinny jeans showing off your naglitas, meaning your my, my butt, right? And showing off your pecs, or if you're a woman, you're showing off your nice boobs, right? You're doing everything you can to attract your mate. This is true in business. You're doing everything you can to attract your next mate. And let's be real, we're classy. I'm not a hoe, neither are you. So we're not saying I wanna sleep with everybody in the room. What we're saying is we wanna be selective, we wanna be careful with, and we ultimately wanna attract the person that's gonna see full value and who we are. And this is true in business. And Craig is basically saying, look, babies, I will give you the spotlight so that when you walk into a room, you are brighter than brighter. It can be, you're already bright, but let's make you even brighter and stand out amongst the rest. What makes me unique? I'm showing up here naked and we're about to talk about taxes. So Craig, we're going to talk about trust. Trust me that trusts are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and you, my friend, asked a question, and I may, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. And um, and you said, I want to know about this trust. And I got some complexity. But would you be willing to share with me a little bit about why this topic is important to you? And let's talk about that. So I am uh, uh, the youngest of, next to the youngest of seven. And uh, my parents uh, held 1,500 acres in California. Uh, on the river adjacent to the Sequoia National Forest. And the property was put into a trust uh, before they both passed away. So that is why I was asking about it. And the reason for the trust was the property taxes in California, if, if you transfer ownership and it's not in a trust, the property taxes increase exponentially. Oh, uh, wow. You try and keep it in a trust to keep the property taxes limited. Uh, my neighbors, for example, a new neighbor would could be expected to spend somewhere in the neighborhood of forty to sixty thousand dollars a year in property taxes, uh, where the property taxes on our place are less than five hundred. Wow! All because we utilized a tax instrument, an entity. So believe it or not, I do talk in rapid tax savings formula. I do talk about entities, but I talk about it in terms of business. Trust is slightly different. Trust we can use them in business, of course, and also in our personal lives as well. And so the trust is one of those. Did you know, but fun fact, and one of my friend Jacob, thank you, Jacob, this is a shout out for you. Um, he's a tax attorney and he explained it to me this one. I loved it. And he said, did you know that trust is the oldest form of entity in existence? And it goes all the way back to common law in the UK, in, the, in England. And that's what that's what people use was trust. So you would actually create a trust and then form your run your business out of a trust, which is kind of fascinating. And so, of course, we had to go and muddy it up with all these different types of entity choices. Places. So trusts are quite fascinating because there are multitudes and types of trust. Now I have to tell the people right now that I'm not a, what I would call an estate planner. I'm not a trust expert in this field. I know enough to know because I had to pass a freaking exam in order to become a licensed internal revenue service agent, an IRS enrolled agent. Okay. So here's the truth about it. So trust, you can have things like a living trust, an irrevocable living trust, an irrevocable trust. You can have a blind trust. You can have uh, kinds of trust. Just trust me that the trusts are complex. And depending on what your motus operandi is, is going to determine the type of trust that you may want to go into. So classic uses of trust in business or property, like Craig just mentioned, is what we do is we create a living trust. Trust, just like corporations, or believe it or not, your own LLC, are seen as separate, completely, utterly separate unto the individual. That's the truth. That's the reality about trust. And so what we see a lot of wealthy people do is they'll set up trust in order to protect and to guard assets, and income. And then the third, of course, is tax. And Craig just brought that up. He said, look, if you inherit a house in the state of California right now, you're going to have what they call a step up in basis, meaning that the start of the house price starts at when you inherit it at. 
that's going to now become the assessor's rate in which he's going to assess you that property tax. And like he said, it's $60,000 in, just in his example, right? But by shielding it in a trust, his family was smart. They put the family, the, the home into a trust. And they said, it's the trust who owns the property. It's not us personally who owns it. Craig doesn't own it. The trust owns it. And as a result, when his parents passed away, they said, check this out. You get to live in this house. You get to own this house. But remember, Craig, he doesn't own it. The trust owns it, which means that the basis, the starting price for the tax assessment is what his parents had originally purchased that home for whenever they had purchased it and put it into the trust. And depending on how the lawyers structured the language, they can say things like, well, upon the deceased, when they decedent, when they pass away, maybe the house gets distributed out to the beneficiaries. Craig would have been one. Or maybe they say, ex nay on that plan, eh? Let's instead keep it titled in the trust and just give the rights to use the house, to use the property, to use the business. Let's give it to the beneficiary. And then his parents, the trustors, would have instructed the attorneys and said, you know what? I don't want my children to pay taxes on the income, let's just say, because let's pretend it's a rental property. Right. And they go... I don't want my children to pay the income taxes on the rental property, on the rental income from this, but we want the trust to be responsible for the taxes. So what happens is at the end of the year, the trust, just like a person, files a tax return, a 1041. Interesting, because an individual tax return is a 1040, technical terms. But 1041 is the trust number. And just like an individual, trusts have income. And when they get hit with the tax, guess who pays the tax? The trust does. And when you work with a really good trust attorney, or yep, a trust attorney, they will basically set it up so that the income as it comes into the trust is being set aside to pay for those trust taxes that are going to be coming up. So we do this all the time. If you're a business owner, particularly if you are investing in real estate, oftentimes we will say to clients, consider, and I'm not saying, I'm not giving you advice, so please do not take it as such. It's not advice right now. But we would say, consider setting up a trust, a living trust, and place the property into the living trust for the same reason why Craig's family did it. It's all about asset protection and mainly because of the tax protection that comes along with it. That's how trusts work. Bam! Boom, boom. So now you had a second question, Craig, and you had said, hey, so uh, how to do with, uh, I want to, how do I have my child, I think is what you said, own part of the company so that we can send them to school, something like that. Is that what yeah. you asked? No, what I was curious about was, do I make my grandchildren part owners of the company so that the company can pay for their education without having it as a taxable income? Perfect. Okay. So that is a super complicated and loaded question that okay. I can't even answer in the next 10, 15 minutes, honestly. Okay. But I can kind of give you and everyone else out there a general 30,000 foot view. So um, this is important. So first of all, we never, ever purposefully put and do things inside of our businesses for the intent of trying to avoid taxes. That's the first and foremost, right? So we would never come out here and go, I'm going to do that all for the purpose of avoiding taxes. Hell no. Instead, we're going to say we're going to legally find ways to mitigate our taxes. doesn't mean it's going to go all the way. doesn't mean it's going to be zero. In fact, the fallacy is that they say the rich get richer and they pay zero taxes. The truth is, is that the rich stay rich, but they pay their fair share of taxes. It's a better way of putting it. So needless to say, when you talk about ownership, right, if you were to give your, your grandchildren equity, in your business. Now, now I have to ask clarifying questions. Is it a limited liability company? Is it a partnership? 
Is it a corporation? Is it an S corporation? What's the entity that is your business? And then Craig might answer that. We're not going to do that here, Craig, per se. But he might say, oh, it's a corporation. And so then I would say, all right, then. Well, in that case, what we would do is we would say, all right, well, your children, would, your grandchildren would, in theory, be owning shares of your business. Now, you can do it while you're alive, of course, and you can give them interest in the business. But depending on the structure, again, if it's a corporation, S Corp, et cetera, et cetera, your grandchildren could face their own tax consequences as a result of becoming an owner of the business. And here's a word of caution. In a corporate setting, for example, in theory, one could take control of your own corporation by buying you out in the shares, right? So here's a fun rule. Anybody who owns more than 51% of an organization, of an entity, controls it and makes those decisions. So children, grandchildren in your case, there's something called a, um, a I think it's called a Q-tip. And I think it's something like a, a transfer, it's like a qualified transfer interest I can't, I can't remember what the P is. My tax experts will know. Um, but basically, it's a way in which we transfer assets to our grandchildren. So in your case, you're skipping the, your own children to give it to the grandchildren. And Uncle Sam is aware of this particular loophole and this technique and sometimes comes back. We know it. We hear it as a kitty tax, you know, something like that or a transfer tax. You know, they go, oh, well, hold on just a second. Now, again, I said earlier, I'm not an estate tax person. That's not my expertise. I'm I'm a specialist when it comes to corporations, S corporations, and so forth. But the general gist is that I hire, I bring on the kids, and they own a part of my business. Now they're going to be responsible for the taxes on their share of the income. First of all, right now in estate planning, we might transfer shares or interest in a partnership, for example trickling it every year to our children, our grandchildren. And then we're going to tap into something called the gift tax exclusion rules. <laughs> yes. Did you know that if you gift, I think in 2020, the gift tax limitation is, it's got to be more than what it used to be. I think it used to be 14,000 gift tax, gift tax limitation. Let me see what it is for 2020. Listen, folks, I'm just going to Google typing it in gift tax limits. 2020. And according to Google speaking, that's where Craig's world is. Um, it says that the gift tax limit is $15,000. What that means is that Craig is in theory transferring. He can transfer a maximum value of $15,000 a year. And his recipients, the grandchildren in this case, are not going to have to pay taxes or him for giving more than that limit. That's $15,000. That's your ceiling. What this means is I can go, Craig, I'm your grandchild. Can you lend me $15,000 so I can go buy me a new house? And Craig goes, absolutely. I love you so much. Here's $15,000. But if I go, but grandpa, I really need $16,000. We're going to have a tax problem. So in a way, potentially, because there's another thing called an estate tax issue over here that also filters into this complex rules of trust and estates. So needless to say, now, give them ownership to go to university. I would argue and say, maybe there's a better strategy. So one strategy that we talk about in Rapid Tax Savings Formula is we talk about how we hire our children, potentially your grandchildren to become your employee to work in your business. Now there's a whole bunch of rules and regulations I don't have time for right now, but the idea is you hire them. And if you're structured a certain way, and again, the entity is gonna determine this, you can set something up like, for example, an education reimbursement plan of some sort. And I'm just speaking here, but again, and the idea here is that right now, theoretically, my employees, I can set aside, I think it's 5,000 and some dollars um, that I can contribute towards their education and we get to deduct it as a viable business expense for the benefit of the employee. Now, um, I'm not, again, this is not my area of expertise. I'd have to go do some research, but here's the thing, right? You, you get to essentially contribute towards their education at those limits and it's tax-free to the recipient it's a deduction to the business owner. If you exceed that, then we're going to have some issues. Now, there's another option you could consider. Second option is you could say, well, how about 
if we set up a 529 plan, which is a qualified education expense plan, and then you can contribute to certain amounts every year towards the benefit of the grandchildren so they can pay for qualified business, I mean, qualified educational expenses like right. tuition, boards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a third option we could do, Craig. And that is, is that if they're young enough, we can take out a life insurance policy on them and prepay for their premiums in advance. And when they get older, they'll be able to borrow against their own life insurance policy and they get to take the money out tax-free and they can just pretend not to pay it back. And in the event that they die, the life insurance benefit repays back the borrowed portion and then pays out the remainder to the beneficiaries of that plan. Wow. Son of a bitch. I just gave you three major tax strategies. You did. You did. So, you me, are you? Uh, oh, you're on my show. That's the bill. <laughs> Take off your shirt. That's the bill. No. <laughs> You don't want that, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but needless to say, so that's kind of like what we have to think. We have to consider that, right? So as you guys just saw, taxes is complex, baby. Okay, so my friend Mika is asking a question, and she is saying, does the U.S. have a tax savings free account with the bank? Canada does. I'm just curious. Um, yes, Mika, I sort of mentioned that. That's that 520 net. But Nan, 529 uh, Qualified Education Fund. I forget what it's called. Something, something fund. Um, let me Google it. Google. Google will tell me. It's a 529. I think it's an education. I, just, I don't know the actual um, education. It's, it's called a 529 Education Plan. And I forget what the actual, it's named after somebody who came up with it whenever they wrote this law. Um, but again, the idea there, because you see, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, it's just, it's just called, they just call it a college savings plan. I don't know, legit. I forget the actual name, but the reality is this, we have to consider this in taxation when it comes to taxes. Taxes, I say, is for every action, there's a reaction. So if I get a benefit by giving away my money. Let's use business, for example. If I go to Craig and I give Craig money to build me an advertising campaign, right? That's one hand. I give it to him. On my books, I record it as an expense and I give it to Craig. On the other side of the equation, though, is this thing called income for the same amount that I gave away. So now Craig has income for the same amount that I wrote off on my books. So each time that money is going from one hand to the next, there is literally a taxable consequence that's happening in both directions. This is true when you go to the store and you buy something and you pay a sales tax. This is true when you pass away and you have an estate worth more than $5 million you're going to pay taxes. This is true if you give more than $15,000 in 2020. So we're in 2021. I guess I should have given you those rates. Um, but the point is, is every action, there's a reaction. And this is why it's so important for every single one of us as taxpayers to invest with a tax planner like myself or to invest with, that's all there is, a tax planner or better yet, a business profit tax coach extraordinaire. So with that, Craig, did I help you answer your question? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, I, better than I expected, in fact. And, and, I, and I do have to share with you an anecdote from my youth regarding taxes. Go for it. I'd love it. Okay. So um, when I was in 1988, I got a letter from the IRS telling me that I owed them $144,000. I wasn't even making that much money in five years at the time. And uh, so uh, I didn't know what to do. I was actually scared. It came certified mail, you know, it was like, I was totally rattled. So I called my dad. I said, dad, I just got a bill from the IRS for 140 grand. What should I do? He said, well, you don't call me, call a lawyer. <laughs> 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 and so uh you know he, he left me hanging uh now um the lawyer took care of it 
You know, I got it. Really wasn't my. It really wasn't my bill. But then about five yeah. years later, I got a, another bill from the IRS for fifteen hundred dollars, fourteen ninety eight. And so I called up my lawyer. I go, "Ah, oh, we're gonna we're gonna fight this. I don't owe the money." He goes, "Craig, you can pay me twenty five hundred dollars to fight it and still pay them, or you can just pay them." <laughs> Well, and it depends around the facts and circumstances. I mean, I had a client that owed half. I've actually had two clients that have owed half a million dollars in taxes and they paid me to represent them and they paid exactly zero dollars to the IRS. So, um, and this happened uh, twice with two half million dollar clients. Um, And then I had one client that owed over $43,000 and made very good money actually. And because of the facts and circumstances, again, we got the, so paid me, invested with me to represent them. And we actually got their tax bill down to $3,000 from 43. Yeah. So 40 grand. So I always say to people, look, there's always two choices when it comes to your taxes. Um, in the, in, in, when it comes to planning, like right now we're planning for 2021. Why? Because it's illegal for me to plan for 2020. Why? Because we'll know what the tax is because the tax returns are out. Okay. That's why it's illegal. Right. So I can only really plan for 2021. I mean, that's the honest truth. So what I always tell people is you got two routes. You can either pay the government, but in my book, I talk about this. He doesn't want your money to begin with. He wants you to invest your money in people like myself, Craig, and everybody else that will help you to make money, honey. That is why you go into business to make a profit. Like I said earlier, a profit so that you can go and enjoy your life and experience financial happiness. So this gives me close to the end here. And what I'd like to say, first of all, is I mentioned my class, Rapid Tax Savings Formula. If you're interested, the next class is going to start up here in a couple of weeks. Right now, we are offering, uh, I want to say it's over $5,000 in scholarships for small business owners to apply. And what you're going to get out of it is you're going to understand your entity choice. You're going to understand what is a deduction and what can you do. You are going to get out of it um, how to separate yourself from your business and take on the hat and own the badass CEO that you and every one of my entrepreneurs were meant to be. And then, of course, we have a live three-day event where we go into the application of what we teach you. So if you're interested in that, definitely I'm going to put the link right here. And then I got to come back to Craig. And I've been kind of slowly posting it on here. But if you want to get 4.9 million clicks like his other client did, you got to go to darlingdigital.us. And if a website doesn't turn you on, then send him a link. Just don't tell his wife, Craig at darlingdigital.us and connect with him. Allow him to take you to the next level. Does that sound good to you, Craig? That is so awesome. Thank you very much for that. You didn't need to do it. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I wore a shirt. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. It's all good. It's all good. Look, this is what I learned a long time ago. I certainly am not in the position to judge. That I know to be true. Why? Because I grew up from the moment I was born, I was judged and I was ridiculed and I was basically put down my entire life. But this is what we do. From dog shit and horse shit and cow shit grows flowers and roses. And right now, I'm living in a sea of poppies. So that's all I can say, Craig. That's all I can say. If you're interested in learning more about Rapid Tax Savings Formula, please feel free to click on the link. I'm putting it in the comments right now. Go find out a little bit more about these awesome opportunities. Um, And I certainly look forward to seeing you guys all next time in this most amazing and fabulous 2021. I also forgot to do one other shameless plug. On January 21st of 21, we are relaunching the ABCs of deductions. Are you ready? On paperback. So a big thank you to D. Collins of Success Creation Academy, um, the publication company that helped me to put this together. And um, next week, we're going to have a guest on here. And who's on my guest next week? The 14th. 
We are going to be talking to a very slow computer right now. I guess it's tired. It wants to go home. I've worked it too much today. Um, who, Brenda, uh, I think it's uh, Kelhofer, is going to be joining us. And um, we're going to be talking about something. Let's see. What are we going to be talking about? Do, 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 do. Okay, I got a whole bio here. Hold on one second. She's a great guest for you. She's all into financial literacy. There we go. That's what it was. Thank you. I was like looking at this. I'm like, oh gosh, I give know, me a while. Talk to her. She's, she's sharp. So there you go. See, even Craig knows who she is. So we're gonna have we're gonna talk about financial literacy because here's the honest truth. If we don't know, I'll use Craig. If we don't know how our advertising monies are being spent and the return on those investments, then how can we make decisions? that will set us up for success. And you need to know and understand your financials and your money, honey. So with that, I'm Jonathan Bengal here, host of Naked Tax Talk. And remember babies, it's all with mucho, mucho, mucho dinero. Until next time, I look forward to seeing you all. Bye and thank you, thank you. Craig, thank you so much for being a guest here on my show. And thank you to all of my viewers who see me faithfully. I am so thankful and so appreciative of every single one of you. May you all have an amazing rest of the day, the evening, or whenever you see this show. Thank you. And we're out. Boom, 